Hello, semi-sentient bipedal creatures of this planet and the lizard people who live among us. You are at the Real Turkey Channel. This is the last broadcast. This is the last broadcast of 2022 by your loving presenter Attila Yeshilada, who has started the morning by hitting the eggnog too hard. So obviously, sound and voice quality is not going to be too good in this video. What are we going to do today? We are going to do as tradition dictates five predictions for Turkey in 2023 and then we're going to take a break for roughly three weeks to get our head together and provide better content in 2023 though of course this is merely a hope rather than a prediction or the manifestation of a sound business plan to be perfectly honest with you You know, I've been doing this for 35 years. I mean, you know, economics and politics. And I have this habit of coming up with predictions for the next year in all 35 of these. None of these have turned out. So this time I decided not to go alone, but invite a panel of wise experts to answer the most frequently asked questions about Turkey in 2023. Here we go. Enjoy it. These are the predictions. I'm sorry. These are the questions that are being asked. Well, given the massive unrest in Iran and Turkey being the neighbor to Iran, sharing several similarities, the first question is, can Turkey turn into Iran? Mr. Erdogan, our incumbent president, may he live for 10,000 years, recently said inflation will drop to 20% in 2023, currently it's 85%, and he added anyone who plans for higher inflation than 20% will have to face me. No kidding, honestly, this is what he said. So I suppose we have to ask the question of can Erdogan avert a stagflation, which is defined as low growth with very high inflation. Those of you who follow Turkey may have read or heard that Erdogan's good friends abroad, uh, important names uh, like Putin, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and the guy who runs Qatar or the family who runs Qatar, Sheikh something or other, have begun sending him election gifts, actually large checks written to bankroll his election spending. Uh, so the question is, is there still the possibility of a currency crash before the elections? Experts say no, I will say yes. <coughs> and of course, the key question for 2023, which alliance will win, will win June 2023 elections? To recall, there are three alliances the governing coalition of AKP, MHP, the main opposition, nowadays called Table of Six, because it consists of six parties led by center-left CHP and center-right EIP. There is a third alliance led by the pro-Kurdish rights party, HTP, essentially a constellation of small uh, left-wing parties. So which side will win? Remember, there will be two elections, a presidential and a parliamentary, held simultaneously. If there is no winner in the first round of the presidential elections, it's like Georgia Senate election. Uh, a candidate needs to capture 50% plus one of the total votes cast to be declared the winner. If no such winner emerges, the election goes to the second round where the one who gets the most votes gets elected. And finally, uh, for the second half of the year after the elections, is there redemption for the ailing Turkish economy under a new administration? So let's get started without further ado. Can Turkey turn into Iran? Yes, that possibility exists. 
many of the conditions that compelled the brave people of Iran to pour into the streets and protest against the regime, facing a hail of bullets, torture, sexual abuse, and all sorts of other inhuman treatment in the, hand of, in the hands of the Mullahs and its fascist police forces, exist in Turkey. What are these? A. Turkish economy sucks. I mean, we're going to close the year with roughly 3.5% growth, which is fairly low in Turkish standards. Moreover, growth has started from 5% at the beginning of the year and decelerated, which means people feel worse. Two, of course, soaring inflation. We also had a weekly uh, cyclic currency like Iran, but thanks to the stellar efforts of our central bank, it has been brought under control, but the equilibrium in the currency market is extremely fragile. Moreover, massive oppression. I mean, it's not as ugly and as fascistic in Iran Nevertheless, uh, we do have an Erdogan regime which wants to create the so uh, Islamic and socially conservative society and is not reluctant to use excessive force or manipulation or torture or persecution to achieve that end. And finally, one thing we have different than Iran, we have millions of refugees flooding Turkey from all around the uh, region which has made life miserable uh, for the labor class. Now, please, I don't want to be misunderstood. The Real Turkey channel is not racist. Uh, and I think, in general, immigration enriches a country economically and socially, as I had noted in my previous videos. But remember, we have a population of 85 million, and we had like 8 million newcomers in the last 10 years. This is too fast and too much for a society to absorb their causing frictions and driving real wages down. So all the you know potential is there. Uh, on top of that, um, we are going to have dual elections in June 2023, before which Erdogan is going to resort to foul play because he is losing in the polls and he knows if he loses the presidential elections or even the parliamentary elections, his political career is over. He, his family, his cronies, uh, a hardcore Islamist in Turkey, roughly 10-15% of the population, are going to try everything to win this election, uh, which means, again, you know, social unrest, uh, pouring out to the streets in support of Erdogan, arrest of opponents. Uh, also, traditionally, when Turkey has political tensions or when the country is divided along social or political issues, other actors in the region that don't necessarily like Turkey capitalize on this opportunity to, work to further weaken the country. Terror attacks is a good example or a bad example of that. We had a bomb attack in the main square uh, of Istanbul, sort of like Times Square a couple of weeks ago. These can be repeated simply because the police and intelligence agencies are too busy busting dissidents rather than doing their jobs. So social unrest could become a feature uh, of Turkish politics. A couple of trigger events. As you watch this video, the very popular and CHP mayor of Istanbul, Mr. Ekrem Mamoglu, may have been convicted of defaming the high election board and be banned from holding elected office, which, of course, to his fans, is blasphemy. The pro-Kurdish rights party, HDP, will also probably be banned from politics by our Supreme Court called Constitutional Court on account of treason and sedition. These are the kind of things that really infuriate people and cause them to protest on the streets. The second question is, can Erdogan avert a devastating stagflation in the economy? As it stands, the consensus forecast, or my perception of consensus forecast for the Turkish economy, is chronic external deficits probably to the tune of $40 billion, 
for the entire 2023. That's sort of like 5% of the GDP, which is fairly high. And financing of this current account deficit is very poor, <laughs> largely money sent by Russia and GCC, friends of Erdogan, as well as unidentified flows, possibly narcotics money uh, or Erdogan's cronies repatriating some of their ill-begotten funds to help him win elections. But anyhow, it's a very fragile situation. Um, when it comes to growth, Turkey started the year pretty well, you know, coming out of the pandemics, etc., etc. Uh, had a great tourism season, massive fiscal stimulus started early, and we have the loosest monetary policy in the world. If you think Bank of Japan pursues an unprecedentedly lose monetary policy, look at Turkey, where the going rate of inflation is 85% and the policy rate of the central bank is 9%. So we're operating at the kind of real negative interest rates that would make Japanese central bank governors blush and probably commit harakiri or something like that. So can Erdogan turn this around? He thinks he can. He thinks Turkey is going to have very robust growth thanks to his invention called the new economy model, which is essentially an export-driven economy. And... Um, Deu ex machina, which means without really explaining how, he thinks he's going to reduce inflation from the current 85% to 20%. Obviously, I don't think any of this is possible. None of the experts that are in our panel think any of this is possible. His only means of fighting inflation is fixing the currency. Not stabilizing the currency, but fixing the currency. The dollar TL exchange rate at 18.6 to the TL. Obviously, a weak currency does cause inflation, but the opposite is not true. If you fix the currency, inflation doesn't automatically fall because nowadays it's not driven by supply side shocks, which is what currency depreciation is, or necessarily by demand side shocks, which means excessive domestic demand but simply by expectations. Essentially, everyone and their uncle expects, their aunt expects inflation to be higher next year, so they jack up their prices and their demand for salaries and wages. So no, Turkey is going to have stagflation. Despite massive staff fiscal stimulus that shall be rolled out at the turn of the year, Turkey is going to witness decelerating growth throughout the year well, at least the first three quarters of the year. And if the opposition wins, we may see a turnaround in the last quarter of the year. But uh, it's going to be difficult um, to avoid stagflation. By stagflation, I mean 3% growth at best. <clears throat> and inflation dropping to 40%. That's the best case scenario. We could have 50% inflation. At the end. Now, of course, these are predictions based on current trends. Uh, in the fourth item, I shall discuss the potential election winner and if the opposition wins, whether they can make a difference. The third question I wish to answer is Is there still the possibility of a currency crash before the elections? I have, you know, broadcast several videos about currency crashes. Yeah, I've been proven wrong. The Erdogan administration has always found a hack, a patch, a shortcut uh, to prevent that disaster, but the cost has been very high. At the end, all the methods that have been tried in Turkey have been exhausted. These methods essentially amounted to currency controls, which means confiscating currency of corporates and banks, depositing them, at the central bank, which spends them lavishly to defend the currency, but that lake is now basically dry. <coughs> I'm sorry. So now Mr. Erdogan went head in hand, bagging to his friend Putin and to the Arab sheikdoms in the Gulf for money, making really embarrassing concessions, for instance, to resolve the 
long outstanding dispute between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. He has essentially amnestied the killers of Mohammed uh, yeah, Khashoggi. His last name is Khashoggi. A dissident journalist who was brutally, brutally butchered in the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul. Once Erdogan promised to find the culprits and, and take revenge, then Saudi Arabia offered money and he relented. Saudi Arabia is going to deposit $5 billion with our central bank, essentially blood money. Qatar is going to chip in another $5 billion or so. Azerbaijan might some send some money. Putin is not sending cash, but he is deferring payments due to Gazprom by our national gas importer, Botash, which is a favor to the tune of three to six billion dollars. We really don't know the exact sum. Prior to that, he has sent money to Turkey, roughly seven and a half billion dollars, to finish the construction of a nuclear power plant that a subsidiary of um, Gazprom is building, Rus Atom, I believe, to make sure that the construction can be finished before United States prevents all dollar outflows from Russia to countries like Turkey. So, you know, given all these unexpected inflows and these incessant unidentified flows, which are to some extent narcotics money, but largely uh, tourism money and real estate purchases by foreigners, experts have said, well, no more weak currency. Erdogan won. Central bank will defend the current implicit peg uh, until the elections, after the elections. Well, we don't know. From a technical viewpoint, yes, I can look at our current account deficit forecast and the items that are available for its financing, including these funds from Russia and the GCC. And I would have to say, yeah, it can be financed without a currency shock. But that's not the only way currency shocks happen. Sometimes currency crises take place because there's a confidence shock. Now remember, uh, there are roughly uh, $400 billion of deposits in the Turkish banking system, all with maturities of less than six months, and half of those are in dollars, the other in Turkish liras. In the past, when Turkish retailers have panicked, they have either taken their money out from banks or they have converted their Turkish lira holdings to hard currencies, both of which are prior conditions for a currency crash. I predict, based on the previous predictions, that such a case might happen, say, by March or so, which is social unrest undermining sentiment, the opposition rising in the polls, creating the impression that Erdogan era is over, Erdogan resorting to foul play, which is going to further cause panic among investors. All of these could create a situation where there is a run on the banks, which is depositors either convert their TL holdings to hard currencies or want cash to stash it under their mattresses or in vaults uh, at their homes or in their business headquarters. And given the amount of money that can be taken out of the banks vis-a-vis -vis what central bank has to pay these uh, money, to pay these deposits off, there is a strong possibility, in my view, of a currency shock, which would probably drive the value of the dollar against the lira at least 20% high. And at that point, we will have complete capital controls, which means the ability uh, of the individual depositors to take cash in hard currency out of, the, out of the banks will be limited. Russia tried something like that at the beginning of the Ukraine war. Kazakhstan tried. Lebanon is currently doing that. Answer to the fourth question, who will win the June 2023 elections? I go by the polls. The opposition candidate 
is going to be Kamal Kılıçdaroğlu. He's going to beat Erdogan in the second round. In current polls, the two opposition alliances command 60% of the national vote versus 40% for AKP, MHP. That's such a wide gap. It's almost impossible to close no matter how much you pork barrel. It's also the division of the votes between pro-Erdogan and anti-Erdogan voters. That is, if you are an AKP or MHP voter, it's almost certain you are going to vote for Erdogan uh, and vice versa. If you're an opposition voter, you are very unlikely to vote for Mr. Erdogan. So to me, the elections are foregone conclusions. And this is why I think uh, there is going to be social unrest in Turkey because Erdogan is going to resort to foul play, but uh, the shenanigans don't work in Turkey. At the end, he will lose the elections, and like Trump, uh, he'll be uh, dragged out of Turkish White House kicking and, and screaming. So, by June 2023, Turkey should have a new government with Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu as the new president, the chairwoman of EYP, Mrs. Meral Akşener as the chief cabinet minister and actually the chief executive of the country, and a cabinet uh, that consists of ministers from the six parties that make up the main opposition alliance. Can they do something meaningful to turn the economy around, to reduce political tensions, to somehow relieve the misery? Yeah. Some of the job is very easy. If your problem is high inflation, chronic current account deficits, we know the remedy. Tight monetary policy that's raising interest rates. Tight fiscal policy, which means cutting unnecessary expenditures in the budget. And finally, and most importantly, credibility. To have a prime minister, a central bank governor, and an economy czar, finance minister, who are respected by the markets and the business community, who herald, you know, acceptable or feasible plans to improve the economy, such as monetary tightening or fiscal austerity, and to carry through with them. And I think all of these are possible. I've interviewed uh, some of the economics teams of the opposition parties. I've shot several videos on their declarations, what they intend to do. They're essentially going to go back to orthodox economic policies. And I think they will be able to reduce inflation. Obviously, we're going to have a shallow recession, but that oughtn't to hurt the poor because another promise they have made is to raise the welfare spending out of the budget from 3% of 4% of the budget to 12%. And of course, current account deficits usually go down when the economy slows down and when the central bank raises interest rates, which attracts financial flows from abroad. Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu promised to attract $100 billion of uh, financial capital and FDI from abroad while well, all politicians exaggerate, but my impression from conversations with potential investors and again members of the opposition is that within the first year of the new government, Turkey can easily attract $50 billion, which ought to reduce the pressure on the currency, allow central bank to build up FX reserves, which would also increase Turkey's credit rating, and it would make it easier for the Turkish sovereign corporates and banks to borrow from abroad, which would bring more foreign currency, it would reduce bond yields, and it would increase the availability of loans, all of which would probably ameliorate the problems caused by the recession. Now, obviously, this is the easy stuff. Then there is harder stuff. For instance, in the first quarter of 2024, Turkey is going to hold municipal elections. The big question is whether the opposition alliance is going to stick together and contest these elections as a single party or whether they are going to compete with each other. I don't know the answer, but 
I think uh, they are more uh, likely to cooperate because they understand that if they lose municipal elections, the victory in general elections may be for nothing. If we can survive the 2024 municipal elections without a major AKP victory, then the sailing is somehow smoother. A, the global backdrop will improve, that is, the global monetary tightening will be over and global stagflation will probably give to global growth, which is good for Turkish exports. Turkey will be able to get cheaper loans. So, improving the macroeconomic situation is not that big of a problem if you have credible people who know what they want to do and who have better relations with the West. Political tensions will go down because the new government is essentially an alliance of six parties. There are Islamists there, center-right and center-left, and there is hope for cooperation with the Kurds, though I won't promise that. So I think the entire nation will uh, breathe a sigh of relief simply because people are not cursing at each other, which improves investor and business uh, <laughs> sentiment which reflects positively on the economy. Obviously, we will retain our economic relationship and linkages with Russia, continue to remain impartial in the Ukraine war, but relationship with the West will improve simply because when I look at the opposition leaders and their top cadres, they are by default pro-Western. Uh, that doesn't mean we're immediately going to start accession talks with the EU um, uh, and do what the United States wants us to do for 10 years to get rid of our Russian-made S-400 as anti-missile systems. But I think uh, the atmosphere of the relationship will improve and the biggest upside for Turkish politics and the economy might be getting a date from EU to start negotiations on an updated and expanded customs union, which is both a signal that Turkey is once again an accession candidate and that there would be a significant overhaul of the economic relations between Turkey and EU. Of course, there are intractable, pro intractable problems which will take a decade to solve, such as improving the education system, addressing prejudice against women, minorities, LGBTQEI+, against Kurds, against Turkey's minority Islamic uh, sect called the Alevis or the Alevites. I can't guarantee you that the new administration will be able to solve these problems because, first of all, one needs a public consensus to be able to to craft the kind of policies to solve these problems. But I think uh, if they manage to survive 2024 municipal elections and continue in the spirit of cooperation rather than destructive competition, they have a much better chance of doing good for Turkey than Mr. Erdogan and his nationalist ally, Mr. Bahçeli. Okay, well, this was the last broadcast of Turkey uh, for Real Turkey Channel. Uh, for Turkish speakers among you, I am also an author. You see the cover of my fifth book, Economics in the Age of Pandemics. Uh, it's just come out. Uh, just wanted to say this. And finally, my gratitude to all of you who watched through poor sound and visual quality. If you like the channel, press the like button or write a comment. Apparently that pleases the AI that runs YouTube uh, and the world at large, really. I would like to be viewed more in 2023. But most importantly, stay well and preserve your mental health. This is Atilay Shilada for Real Turkey Channel saying goodbye and Merry Christmas.